Nate, Nate Reardon, uh, you're in Washington State, right? Yes. Where in Washington? I'm here in Seattle, Washington. Okay. Where it's uh, cold and rainy. It's like living in the basement. <laughs> yeah. So we that's you have that in common with Erie for sure. Um, so you own a law firm, two law firms. How's that work? Uh, you know, we we uh, we do two things. We've got. Um, we service a lot of franchisees on the business side, helping them with all of their business needs. And um, on the other side of the firm, we have an insolvency practice where we solve complicated bankruptcy problems. And so we go to bankruptcy court, we restructure, we reorganize. And sometimes those practice areas meet each other when um, franchisees need to be restructured. And we kind of, I think that we're niched, niched into that, but um, we, uh, we go to bankruptcy court, we reorganize businesses. Uh, we go uh, here in Washington, people are doing a lot of receivership now. And so we find ourselves in state court uh, working receiverships, uh, actually lately more than we're in um, bankruptcy court. Interesting. All right, we so I wanna, I wanna get back to that for sure, but that was one of the reasons I wanted to set up this call is you know obviously we represent a lot of business owners. Business owners tend to have those complex uh, bankruptcy problems. So I thought you could just give us a little bit of information explaining, you know, from your side of things, how some of this stuff works. Because I think I think a lot of our clients want to understand the basics of this stuff. And I know that you can handle the real complex. So maybe we can go through some of the some of the basics. So I want to talk about two scenarios. The first one is what if a business is owed money and the the debtor, the person who owes them the money files bankruptcy. And then I want to talk about that restructuring side of things. So if a, if, a, if a business owes more money than it can afford to pay, what are its options? So first thing is, you know, let's say, let's say you owe me money and you go and decide to file for bankruptcy. What, is, what does that mean for me as a creditor? It is critical that you, at that point, find an ethical bankruptcy attorney to look at the case that you're dealing with and give you the facts because you may or may not have any value in continued in, in, in it might not be worth you continuing to invest in pursuing that receivable however we've seen a lot of people mishandle their receivable in bankruptcy just because they think i'm not going to do anything you just need to hire an attorney who's not going to take you for a ride to look at the case that's been filed Look at your claim. Tell you if you think. Tell you if if they they the attorney think that you need professional help filing your claim. You're going to get a proof of claim form. You're going to file that claim in the bankruptcy. And you know if it's hopeless. So if you come to our office and we think it's hopeless, we'll tell you it's hopeless, and that you shouldn't spend any money on us. Well, and that's that's what any competent ethical attorney should be doing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, unfortunately, there are some who will make a career out of your claim by saying, oh, we need to do all this stuff in your case. And, and I'm going to charge you a bunch of money and, you know, just not manage your expectations. And so and, and, and that is not to say that there aren't occasions where you need to lawyer up and pursue your claim because you've got a good shot at recovery. And that there, there might be a path to you getting paid, you know, a decent, respectable portion of what you wrote. So um, so what, what types of things are you looking at to make that determination? So if, I, if I'm owed money and the person files bankruptcy, I don't know if I'm going to get nothing or everything or pennies on the dollar. So what, what type of stuff are you looking at? You know, really what I'm looking at there is what kind of business is it? What kind of revenue is there? And I can get all of that from what's been filed initially. What, um, what are the other claims in the case? So for example, on the most extreme end of things, if a company goes into bankruptcy, it doesn't have very much revenue, it has no profit, there's very little hard collateral, there's not you know, a lot of stuff, and it's got a giant secured claim from a bank. Nobody's getting paid but the bank and the bank's not getting paid. And that, that secured claim is gonna eat up everything and the company would have to go for so much more than it's apparently worth in some kind of liquidation or it would have to somehow revive its its ability to, to make payments in a way that doesn't seem realistic uh, in order for you to get paid. Having said that, if the opposite is true, 
you know, it looks like, hey, there's, you know, they, they got chased into bankruptcy because of tax issues. And in bankruptcy, your tax issues get handled, you know, you, there's a preset formula. So I can look and say, okay, they're gonna have to pay back their taxes at about this amount. I'm looking at the revenue. There's not a big secured lender. There's only about nine of you that are owed money. So, you know, you just need to ride with it, make sure the case is being managed well and file your claim. And you might actually get paid something over time. So the circumstances matter, you know, greatly. Does it matter in that situation what chapter of bankruptcy protection these folks have filed for, whether it's a seven or 11 or 13? Absolutely, and I'm glad you asked that because I should have covered it first. If they filed a chapter 11, that's, we'll call that the reorganization or payment plan over time bankruptcy for the business. The business is gonna try to keep control of the business and they're gonna to try to get out of bankruptcy and still be a business. And if the business has filed a chapter seven, well, that's just a liquidation. Everything that's there that are the assets of the business is just gonna get sold by a bankruptcy trustee. And all you're looking at is, okay, well, how much do we think that's gonna be when they sell all that stuff? And is there any money left over? Yeah, and the, the same thing, the, the secured creditors get paid first and then the unsecureds may get something, nothing, everything, which is really unlikely in a chapter seven. You know, the other thing that's true, and this, this isn't necessarily legal advice, but most, I, I haven't, I, we, you know, we've appeared in cases around the country and I've, with the exception of very large places like, you know, LA or New York, and even to a certain extent then, the bankruptcy bars are small and cohesive. Bankruptcy attorneys tend to be less litigators and more collaborators. And so often what I'll do is if I get a client who's got a, something, I, I typically know the attorney who's, who's, man, who's handling the case for the debtor. I'll just call him up. Hey, I'm going to make a big deal in this case. Talk me out of it. And they'll shoot me straight. Well, you know, I, they'll, think, they'll... I, I think that my, the difference that I've seen in bankruptcy court and other types of state or federal court is uh, depending on the case, the judge gets very involved. So they they want you to work things out. They're they're sitting down with the parties and having hearings or meetings or whatever, and telling them, you know, I can sit and preside over a trial, or you guys can mediate this or work it out on your own. So it's I think it I think your experience is is totally accurate that it's a pretty collaborative group that understands what they're working towards, but also they're getting that direction coming down from the judge telling them to to you know, put their toys down and stop fighting. It, it's a weird little world in bankruptcy court. I've been sent out in the hall more than once with the admonition like, hey, I'm gonna make one of you really unhappy. So why don't you go out in the hall for 20 minutes, see if you can't work this out, come back in with a solution. But I swear to God, one of you is gonna lose. <laughs> and then you, know, you go out in the hall and your client's there and you're like, okay. You heard it. It's, you heard him, it's all or nothing. Yeah. You wanna choose your destiny or you wanna roll the dice? Let's go. All right. So um, the flip side of that coin, I, I'm, a lot of businesses are struggling right now, right? That, that Absolutely. goes without saying. And you and I both know that's going to continue for a long time as PPP funds get spent, as idle funds get spent, as we likely get hit with a second wave. So when, it, when should a business start thinking about talking to someone about restructuring their business or considering bankruptcy? I would, you know, this is hard. This is easy advice to give and it's hard advice to take. Yep. The sooner, the better. And there's always, you know, money's tight and you're, you're trying to make it work and you're trying to hold it together. And the last thing you want to do is, is either A, file bankruptcy or B, give some lawyer five grand so that he can talk to you about, you know, the problems that you already know you have. Like, right. I get it. But here's the thing. If you talk to a bankruptcy attorney up front, they're at least going to give you a list of things not to do. And those things are critical. And I cannot stress this enough. And so I, if there's nothing else that you take away from this, from watching this video, whoever you are, business owner, don't dump your 401k out to save your business until you've talked to a bankruptcy lawyer. Please. The number of times I've had people come into my office and they're out of cash because they they dumped out their 401k. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm harping on this is nobody can touch your 401k except the IRS, but you really, you really have to make the map for them to do that. 
Now, now the flip side of that is not don't go and hide a bunch of money in your 401k before you file bankruptcy either, right? I mean, that's we're not going to we're not going to yeah. We'll, we we'll, we'll get to we'll get to transfers, but um, it, often when people show up, having you know gotten they they've liquidated an asset to reinvest in the business, which is common. You know, you're trying to save your business, so you sold the vacation home and you took the money and put it in the business or you dumped out the 401k or, you know, you borrowed money from mom or whatever you did. That's totally normal. But if you'd talked to me first, I could have gotten you more for the money. Yeah. I could have gone to the bank maybe and said, Hey, we're going to sell the vacation home voluntarily and we're going to put it in the business. But in order for that to be worthwhile, you got to do some things for us. And I'm going to ask for more than my client is comfortable asking for, because when your business is struggling, you just feel, you just feel beat down. Like you just got to go out there and like, you know, Hey, we owe these people money and I just got to throw money in here and try to make this work. You got to turn them into your partner. You got to tell them what you need to make it. And you got to have those conversations. I think, now, I think at that point for a lot of people, you know, so many people look at their, their business as their baby, think that they get very emotional at those times. And, and also like it's the essence of, essence of entrepreneurship saying, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to work it out. And I, I think a good attorney can take the emotional piece out of that and, and think very logically and critically about what's happening. Um, and and my, my general rule of thumb would be, you know, we, we all have our worries. We all have our concerns. But the moment you're making a decision to pay one bill and not another one, that's, that's when you should really be getting some advice and some input from somebody who's been through this, probably an attorney. Um, but that's, that would be my rule of thumb is when you've got to make that decision of paying one bill over another, that would that's, be, you know, that's a great point. And, you know, I, I've had folks show up and say, look, you don't need to file bankruptcy right now, but let's prioritize a few things. Yep. And they're often very surprised at the things that I will tell them to pay and the things that I think they can wait. And a good bankruptcy attorney will also coach you on, okay, if you don't pay this, here's what's going to happen. And I'll just walk you through it. Here's the timeline. Here's what they're going to say. Here's what they're going to do. And as a result of getting that advice, two things would be true. One, you can plan. And two, I guarantee you, you feel a lot better because it's not... Nothing I have to tell you about what happens in insolvency, in bankruptcy, in, in liquidation, none of it is as bad as you've made it in your head. I promise you. I've been watching this movie for 23 years. What you think is going to happen and what you read on the internet is probably not nearly as bad as that. And if you just, in some ways, consulting with a decent bankruptcy attorney is a mental health break. Because yeah. once you understand kind of the parameters of what's going to happen next, you're just going to feel better. Yeah. Well, I, th I think a lot of people immediately go to, well, I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to be homeless. Right. I mean, that it's like oh, yeah. immediate worst case scenario. My kids are going to have nowhere to live. I'm not going to be able to eat. Um, so I think, I think being able to, that's talk just human. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, smaller business, right? Somebody maybe a, a single member LLC or something like that. And the business owner owes a bunch of people money. And he says, ah, screw it. I'm just going to shut it down and start a new LLC or, I'm going to shut it down and walk away. What do you say to somebody that that's coming in with that mentality? Well, that's a fairly common vision of what might be a viable path. The problem that you have in closing down one LLC and starting another one is that you can be sued for what's called successor liability. And when that happens, two things are true. One, all the debts that you just tried to evade are going to show up anyway, because you're, you're, you're a successor. And so they can say that, well, it's the same business. And so I sh they should still owe the money. Yep. But two, if it ends up in court, you're going to look like the person who did the shady thing. And you, you don't want to be wearing that hat in front of the judge because you, you just, it, you can't, you can't be seen any other way. Yeah. Now, are there ways to successfully, from both an optic standpoint and from a legal standpoint, get from this business to this business without getting into trouble? Yes, absolutely. I'd say they're, they're way beyond the scope of this conversation. But if you talk to a good lawyer, they should be able to walk you through 
how you would close one business and open another one without getting into trouble. And it, it's not intuitive and it varies state by state. There's different rules, but. Um, and I'm actually, I'm going to get back to the, the state law thing, but um, what about, is there some sort of timing issue with filing bankruptcy? So there's like a look back period where a court can come in and say, you've done this recently, we're going to undo it, or we're going to go and get that money. Is there, there an issue with the timing there? So as we, as we float, as we move into a bankruptcy, we're always looking at some things that have happened behind us. And so um, it kind of gets back to a question that you asked earlier that we didn't really, that, that, I, that I wanted to get back to, and I know you did too, the kind of the strand of it is uh, transfers. You cannot, um, you cannot give away your car to your kids. You can't give away your house to your brother and expect that to take. And that, and there's kind of two levels of analysis here. The first level of analysis is what's called preference analysis. Um, when you file a bankruptcy, we look back on the, on the debts that you paid. This is a little simplistic, but let's just do that. Yep. We look back 90 days. Has anybody been paid outside the ordinary course in the, of business in the last 90 days? And if so, we may have to make them give the money back. That's, that's for just arm's length vendors. So yeah, well, go ahead, get into the second part and then we'll get back to that. Se the second part is family members. Have you, have you an insider, you know, a business partner, a family member? Have you, have you transferred something to a family member within the last year? Second level is if you have done things to the way the statute reads, hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor by transferring things, you can get your bankruptcy blown up. You can, you can lose your ability to discharge your debts. So you have to be very, very careful about what you do, what you give away, what you pay in the months leading up to bankruptcy. It, it really becomes, it, for larger bankruptcies where we're filing individuals, that analysis is most of the real work that we do. Everything else is frankly not that difficult, but looking at what's been done, you know, did, it, it, did you put something in a trust? When did you put it in the trust? How long ago was it? What does the trust say? All those things. And that was and that was actually the example I'm gonna, I was going to use is if I've got my business with a whole list of creditors and I owe my mom 10 grand, I shouldn't go and pay her five and then file bankruptcy the next day, right? They're going to look upon that not so favorably and, and may actually make my mom pay that money back into the bank. Yeah, mom's probably ends up paying the money back. And, yeah. you know, it... Not getting paid is one thing, but having to give the money back, that's that's cold cut. People <laughs> people hate that. All right, what about, uh, and we, you mentioned receivership at the beginning. Bankruptcy is obviously federal law, right? So it's yeah. it, there's a lot of similarity no matter which courtroom you walk into across the country. But how, how does bankruptcy law and, and state law, which differs obviously state to state, how do those two sort of interplay? You know, it's um, receivership varies broadly state to state, you know, and, and here in Washington, receivership was something that wasn't used very often. And then about 15 years ago, we completely redid the statutes and now it's more user friendly and lawyers are just reaching for it more often because it's just viewed as a more flexible tool in terms of transitioning property or, or uh, businesses. And a receivership is if I owe a bank money or someone money, they can put somebody in place to run my business and pay my bills for me, right? Is that- Yeah, you know, that's in a nutshell, that's great. Yeah, you basically, whether it's a piece of real estate, an apartment building, or whether it's a business, you put it in receivership and then a receiver, a person comes in and, and is, running the, uh, is running the business. And often, often the owner gets let go at that point, uh, gets handed the shoebox and, you know, and the door. We, we've seen some some really unpleasant ones where the, the owners are basically locked out of the business. Like they've they've done things that are allegedly so bad that they, you know, something that they've built from the ground up, they're, they're, they've now had the locks changed on them while somebody else runs it for them and pays their bills. So obviously that's kind of standard operating procedure in a receivership. The, the owner just goes. And when we, we've occasionally had people put their own businesses into receivership and that's the advice we got to give them is the, you're, you have no control after this happens. You're, you're out. It, 
for the most part, a receivership looks very much like a chapter seven. It's just, it's a, it's a, the biggest difference is that you get to pick the receiver. Whereas um, in bankruptcy, uh, I've never seen the exception where there's just a panel of trustees who become, and they just, it's next up, takes the case. But what's, what's the difference at the end? I mean, you get, you get through a chapter seven, sell the assets, pay the liabilities, and whatever debt is left gets, gets wiped out, gets discharged, right? How does that work in a receivership that, you know, the, the creditors who get the pennies on the dollar, the receiver pays the creditors pennies on the dollar, and then what? Well, we got to back up a little here and, and uh, uh, make some definitional um, um, clarifications. Yeah. When an individual files a chapter seven, all of their non-exempt assets get liquidated and 90% of American households that file bankruptcy don't have any non-exempt assets. Right. Basically you file bankruptcy, keep everything you have, you get a discharge, you leave. At, you know what, that might even be 95%. Like most people, you know, all the stuff that you have, your car, your furniture, you're keeping all of that. Um, you know, it, in, in most households are, you know, I always use the example of my house. Like I go through like, yeah, we probably spent, you know, over the life of a, you know, household, probably spent 40, 50, $60,000 on the furniture in there. But if you push it out on the sidewalk, well, it's not worth anything. Anyway, that's an individual. Individual files chapter seven. They're, they're trying to get a discharge of their debts. If a business or an entity files chapter seven, there's no discharge. You just... All, all that you're getting for having filed the seven is that a chapter seven trustee is going to be appointed and there's not gonna be a charge to you to sell all the assets. And they're also gonna go through the books and see if you've taken any money out so you can you know, look forward to the audit. So the, the times when we wanna use chapter seven for a business are fairly select. A receivership for a business looks the same way. At the end, there's not a discharge. There's just payment of pennies on the dollar. And technically what's still owed is still owed. It's just, there's nothing to do about it because everything's been sold. So yeah, so again, there's, a, there's gonna be a strategic decision there about which one may be better in the given circumstance. Where it, where it matters is if you've guaranteed a debt. And per you, personally, you mean? Yeah. yeah, if you personally guaranteed a debt and your company goes into receivership or, or a chapter seven bankruptcy, and only a portion of that guaranteed debt gets paid, after the bankruptcy's over, they, they can still come knocking on your door asking you to, to pay the rest of the debt. And that's, I mean, that's gonna be true for most smaller businesses is the owners guarantee the debt. So that's, that's gonna be another factor that goes into this consideration of what's the best way to- Absolutely. To mess it's, up. It's, um, it, is, it is the exception where the owner has not guaranteed, uh, you know, some if not all of the significant debts, the lease, the secured loan, the line of credit, all those credit cards in the company name, those are actually, you're standing behind all of those too. Yep. And well, and that's, I mean, that's the conversation that we have when we help businesses start where the less debt you can guarantee personally, the better off this could be in the, in the long run. And that actually segues me into the, the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the, these, the new loans that a lot of businesses got, the PPP and the idle. Right. There, one of the major things about the, the disaster loan was that there are no personal guarantees for most businesses because they were under the, the threshold for that. So that is theoretically a debt that only your, your entity may be responsible for. How are you seeing the PPP and the idle impact these decisions that you've been talking about uh, with business owners, with, with creditors or debtors for such a long time? You know, it's we're, we're sort of a weird posture in the insolvency world. The PPP money that people have gotten has pushed decisions about what to do forward to where, yeah, I guess I, I, I guess the phrase to use is kicking the can. Lenders, landlords, business owners are all kicking the can and they're hoping that, understandably hoping that uh, that you know the the pandemic will clear, that the economy will reopen, that things will look more normal, or that there will be additional stimulus to provide them, um, you know, kind of ongoing um, uh, support as they try to muddle through. 
where we get questions is people calling us up and asking us, can they use their PPP money for something else? And will that trigger a personal guarantee that doesn't exist? Because none of the PPP loans have been personally guaranteed unless you took it out in your own name. Right. If you took it on the business name, it's just a business debt. And uh, we actually we actually wrote kind of a long article about this, which on the PPP side of things concludes with probably not, which is a disappointingly um, common lawyer answer. Yeah. Uh, it looks to us like where the SBA gets exercised about caring what you've done with your PPP loans is if you fraudulently induced the loan in the first place. Right. Like that, that's the big issue. Like that's, that's where you're seeing them sue people. I, I think, yeah, I think in general, if you didn't go out and buy the Ferrari with your money, good, let's keep you out of that category. Yeah. On the other end is you used it all for payroll to keep your people on the books and try and keep your doors open, which was the intent. And somewhere in the middle there is, is that life raft where people aren't sure what to do, but they got to do whatever they can to stay in business. And I, I, I think your analysis, I read that article, I think your analysis was right that you're using it for the right reasons. Now, you may not get the forgiveness, right? Your business may still have to pay it back, but there's not going to be penalties. You're not going to go to jail necessarily. Um, so yeah, there's there's a big window of gray area. There. You know, it, probably the best example is you're sitting there with the PPP money in the bank and you got to fix the roof. So you use the PPP money to fix the business roof to keep things going. I just don't think that you're going to get, you're, you're not going to get that forgiven, but I don't think you get in trouble. Right. Now, there are ways that you can use it to fix the roof where you will get into trouble. So again, good time to call and talk to somebody who knows what. All right, so one of, uh, one of the things that we see pretty commonly with businesses that are having cash flow issues is they go out and find sometimes called working capital loans, although there's good and bad types of working capital loans, but like the, these merchant account loans where I can borrow money from my business and then it's going to get repaid every time a customer swipes a credit card. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Those, you know, we've had clients who have successfully used those, uh, um, those loans. And so I'm not going to sit here and say that that's just the worst thing you can do no matter what, but those are tough loans and the everyday thing that's rough. Because they, they often they'll you know they're taking money out of your account you're taking off the swipes every, you know every every day and what what ends up happening from a from a bankruptcy consideration is if you're going to make them stop hitting your bank your bank account you are arguably hindering or delaying their ability to get paid because you have to actively do something. You have to open a new bank account and move all your stuff over to a new bank account. There, there's a lot of things that you have to do to get them to stop taking the money. So doing that without filing a bankruptcy is, it's kind of a big decision. And I can't, I, I couldn't sit here on a call like this and say what's right in any given situation. And I, I will tell you that I recently told a guy, I'm like, well, look, you, those are the consequences potentially of doing it. But as we sit here right now in this console, it's clear that if you don't do it, you might as well just shut it in business because you, you cannot any longer afford to do this. And those companies are extremely difficult to even reach. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. We, we've seen them with these, these different working capital loans where you, you borrow a lump sum and, and the underwriting requirements are minimal, low credit score. You don't even need to be profitable they'll charge you some origination fee of one to 5%. So tack that onto what you're borrowing. The interest rates are 18, 24%, and there's no way to prepay. You, you, no matter what you're gonna pay, for example, two years worth of interest at that rate, even if you paid it off next month. So we've seen a lot of people get into those and, and not understand the cash flow implications of that. So you know, if you're, if you're, if you're taking out a loan, most people aren't looking at the terms that come through. You just click to accept them, but can get into some, some major, major trouble with those. One of the things we also see in those loans is um, as part of the loan documents, and most people don't get this, is they've signed a confession of judgment, which the creditor is holding. And often they're holding the judgment 
and can use it only in the state that they're operating in. So what happens is they'll file it in New York state and then either they'll um, use it to garnish your bank because your bank is, you know, a federal, a federal bank with, with uh, um, branches in every state, or if, if they need to bring it to the state, the notice requirements on them bringing a judgment to your state are different. Sometimes you get noticed, sometimes you don't, but we've had several creditor, we've had several clients wake up to find that a creditor has drained their bank account with a garnishment. And uh, that, that, I mean, that can certainly happen after a lawsuit and you get a judgment, but the, the, the issue with confessed judgments is you may not have an opportunity to defend that or really bad things can happen to you before you have a chance to get in front of a judge and, and try and stop it or try and undo it. So yeah, confession of judgment clause is definitely a, a major issue for people when, when they're, they're struggling, frankly. You know, um, kind of winding down here and, uh, you know, we, earlier in the conversation, I went over sort of, you know, go see a bankruptcy attorney, you'll, you'll kind of get a mental health break for it. One of the things that, you know, I think a good, just about any good attorney can do for you, but um, that a bankruptcy attorney can do for you is walk you through, what does it look like if you get sued? And I think that when people come to my office and I say, okay, here's what a lawsuit in collections look like. And I walk them through the timing. I walk them through how long it takes. Often it's a relief because they find that they've got more time to deal with that than they thought they did. Good point. It, usually I can almost visibly see them settle down like, oh, it doesn't happen off in the ether. They have to serve me. Then I answer. Then there's a time. And then if I hire an attorney, we can extend the time. And if I don't, here's how much time it is. I mean, the confession of judgment that you gave them is the exception of that. But by and large, understanding your rights is in, in totally and rights as a as a debtor when someone has sued you can provide you a lot of comfort. I mean, it's not it's it's not a panacea. It's yeah. not you know you're not going to walk out thinking oh it's all going to be fine. Right. But you are going to feel better because you realize that you've got you will see things coming and you'll have some time to react and, and plan. That's what our like every every lawsuit here in, in state court says you've got to file an answer in 20 days. And by the time the sheriff serves them and it was filed, you know, a week before that, by the time they, they have the chance to even call us, they're freaking out because they got three days left, not realizing if you miss the 20 days, you automatically get another 10 days at least. And we're a small enough community that if if you retain us, I'm gonna call the other lawyer and say, give me an extension on this. And 99 times out of 100, it's it's not an issue. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Having that call before you as an individual pick up the phone and call the plaintiff's attorney and, and beg and plead, call a lawyer who's going to be on your side. Uh, and and I, I th that was that was a really good point that you I guarantee within reason, uh, you're going to feel better after that conversation because you're not only are you going to realize you have more time, but if you talk to a lawyer and you're comfortable with what you're with what they're saying, you're you're going to have a lot more certainty about what's going to happen, and that's you know the that can cut down the fear quite a bit. So that's a good point. Absolutely, right. I'm shutting this down. Um, oh, I should say this. Well, Nate, thank you very much. Um, I think this is going to be really beneficial for a lot of the people that we work with, a lot of people that we talk to. Um, you're on the West Coast. If anybody needs to reach out for, to you or wants to get more information or, or read, wants to read these articles that you were talking about, what's the, do you have a website that they can go to and get more information? Uh, you know, we, uh, um, you can go to wrlawgroup.com. That's wrlawgroup.com. And you can find our blog there and uh, connections to some of the articles that we've written and published on Medium uh, about, um, planning for bankruptcy, what's to, what to do if there's bankruptcy, you know, that kind of thing.